well. Duke Baxter here at Zone Sports Academy with Dominate the Diamond. We're so excited to have you on the show today. Please leave in the comments where you're viewing from, what level coach you are. Are you a first-time coach? Are you a seasoned veteran coach? And what age are you coaching? Are you coaching T-ball, rookies, A-ball? Are you teaching high school ball, travel ball? Uh, love to get some comments. Would love to get some, some thumbs up if you like what we're talking about. Pound the heart button. Um, and also, if you, if you hear it or see a question in the comments and you have something to add to that, please feel free to add to that because us as coaches, we're all coachable. We're really excited and we'll be on here for about 40 minutes. I know you're probably wondering, where's Coach Steve? Well, Coach Steve is in Georgia right now. Um, Probably, it's probably about 100 degrees out there. He's, he's playing with the 16U team. They're doing well. They won the first game. They lost a nail-biter yesterday, 2-1, to one, to a really good team. They played great. So I'm sure he's going to be uh, watching the show and looking at some of the comments that you all have. And we're going to, you know, we'll talk about those. The comments are always is, is what fuels the show, right? So when we look at the comments, we look at what people are asking, some struggles that you may have. Uh, we really like to add and go through it and, and, and break it down and go through some of our challenges that week um, and also on the weekend tournaments. I have a, I coach an 11 year old, 16 year old team is, is my son's uh, town team. Uh, it's a B level town team. And, you know, so we see a lot of different stuff as we head into tournaments from the 16 elite kind of organization with the older guys down to the 11, you know, playing for the, uh, playing for the town. So sure you have you uh you mix in there mix in some questions we'll make sure that we get to all the questions as, as many as we possibly can um but i'm going to start off by talking a little bit about our weekend right so the 11 year olds were playing saturday there's a new umpire behind home plate an older umpire in the field that i've known for a long time and i just want you as coaches to remember sometimes that, you know, sometimes these umpires are, it's, it's, their, it's their first year. Maybe they don't know the rules. Maybe you can help them with some of the, the different situations. So we had a runner on first base. There was a lefty on the mound and the lefty already had a warning. He already got a warning in the second inning. He kind of, when our guy stole, he, he kind of flinched his hands and then he went to pick off and they called timeout. They explained to him what it was. So now here we are in the third inning. I have a runner on third. There's two outs. And we have a sign where we have the, the runner on first do an early break. So as soon as the um, as soon as the the pitcher came set, our runner took second base. He flinched again, then stepped off the rubber, ran at him, tagged him out. Their team ran off the field. I called timeout. I walked out to the field umpire and said, hey, Mike, did you have a balk on that? He's like, yeah, I saw him flinch. I'm like, but you didn't call a balk. He's like, hold on one second. He went over, talked to the home plate umpire. He said I had him balking. The home plate umpire said it was a balk. Runner goes to second. They had to bring their field back, you know, their team back onto the field. And But it was a very... It was a conversation. So where I'm trying to go with this is, we have to have conversations with the umpires. It's not just screaming, come on, Mike, didn't you see a balk? What are we doing out here? You guys are better than that. And you see that so often with coaches, they just want to go crazy opposed to doing it and handling it the right way. You call timeout, you walk onto the field, you talk to the umpire, and you tell them what you feel and, and, and what you think, and they go through it that way. The same exact thing happened two innings later it's the fifth inning now there's a runner on third base or excuse me there's a runner on second base my son was actually hitting balls pitched my son swung he missed the guy from second was stealing third the catcher came up to throw and he threw the ball and hit my son right in the back the umpire time out he said the batter was out and the runner goes back to second base i call a timeout I walked out onto the field. I said, Mike, I said, how, how is that interference? He's like, well, the catcher threw the ball uh, and, and hit the batter. I'm like, well, were his feet in the batter's box? He said, yes, they were in the batter's box. I said, so that's not interference. 
I said, be, if he would have stepped back out of the batter's box and the, and the catcher then didn't have a clear um, aisle to throw in, that would be interference. But he was in the batter's box. So he then said, runner, go back this side. I'm like, let's just replay. Let's just replay the pitch. Let's no balls, no strikes. And let's just put the runner back on second and redo it. So we finished the inning. He comes back over and he's like, listen, Duke, I've never even seen that happen before. And I should never have called timeout. You, I should have just let the play continue on since he was in the batter's box. I said, yes, but whatever. It was, the first, it was the first time I've ever seen it, right? I've never seen a guy swing and miss and have the catcher take the ball and fire it and throw it right into the, into the batter either. So, again, we're just talking about coach umpire relationships and the importance of that because it's so important that we treat them like human beings and we just do the right thing and we have conversations. Um, so I know another topic I want to talk about is I was actually finished with our game. We won both games Saturday. Our guys played awesome. We won the first game on Sunday. We won the semifinals on Sunday. We're in the finals. Um, and we didn't have our best game. We made some errors early, and the other team just capitalized on it, and, and we fell short. So I was to talking to the kids after the game, hey, you got to get into the finals. To You have to get into the championship to win the championship, right? We were 4-0, played awesome baseball, and at the end of the day, we, we didn't win. Um, but there was no reason harping on the errors. We didn't make an error in four games. And then all of a sudden, the fifth game was like we saved them all up for the championship because the first two winnings were like... They did. So anyway, so I'm walking in the parking lot, and I'm walking. My name's on the back of my jersey, and this coach goes, Coach Baxter. And I turn around, and he goes, Duke Baxter? I'm like, I'm like, yeah, hi, how are you? Carrying all my stuff. He's like, man... We just won the championship, all the coaches, we were just talking about you. I'm like, really? And what he was saying was he was talking about the video that I shot last year when my son went to Cooperstown because they're going to Cooperstown. And he's like, yeah, remember the video with the you guys having the sheets and having all the different things? So what I said to him was, I'm like, hey, so he asked to take a picture with me. We, we shot a picture. It was cool. Uh, and then I got his email address. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to email him the, I have a five-page do's and don'ts in Cooperstown. When you go to Cooperstown, coaches, if you've never been there before, there's stuff that you don't even know what you need. You get the little thing from Cooperstown, but there's some, some things that you're gonna wish you had. So I'm gonna email him those different things, that different list that I have, places to go, things to do, um, things that you should be looking forward to and things that you may not even think about. So I see a couple people on here. Um, if you're going to Cooperstown, leave that in the comments. I wanna see how many of you are going to Cooperstown or know of, of teams that are going to Cooperstown. And I'm gonna uh, see if we can send out an email maybe later on today or tomorrow that has a little, uh, that little laundry list of things that you can do in Cooperstown to make it a, a, a good solid experience because it's so much fun. But it's, you know, having 12 kids in a bunk with you and your coaching staff, you can only imagine that it's pretty challenging. Um, I've been four times. Two times I've been without my kids, and then two times I've been with my kids. So um, I wouldn't say I'm a seasoned veteran at it, but four times is quite a few times to go to Cooperstown. And I have one more kid to go, so I'll, I'll, I'll be there five times. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, so those are some... Those are some uh, interesting things that happened this weekend uh, with the umpires and all that stuff. We also, I also wanted to talk a little bit about another situation that we had, right? Um, we're playing the game and the, there was a pitcher on one of the other teams that just was beside himself. Um, you know, talking, you can tell as soon as a player on his team would make an error, the body language and it was just not good, right? And it just snowballed one after another. The coach would go out to talk to him and it was like he didn't want to have any of it. And it was just, you could tell the team and the environment and the culture that, that it was that we were playing. It was just like, oh my gosh, coaches, you have to make sure that you set the tone with the type of environment and the culture that you want on your team. If you let players... Um, have bad body language or 
show up a player on the field or show up yourself on the field. It just, it makes it so much harder because every player is almost gonna wanna do the same exact thing. There was something they just showed in the big leagues a couple of days ago. The manager went to go out and, and take one of the pitchers out and the pitcher on the mound took the ball and slammed it on the ground. It came up and the, and the, code, the, head, the manager was like, whoa, 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 whoa. You can see him grab him and put his arm around him like, don't be doing that. The second he walked into the dugout, you saw all the veteran players go around that guy like, hey, th this is not what we do. You know, sometimes you're not happy with your performance. And this is a guy that's in the big leagues, right? So think about these 9, 10, 11, 12-year-old kids that maybe strike out with the bases loaded or they hit a couple guys or they walk a few guys, you know, what they're feeling. So... I'm just saying this because it happens at all levels and it's our responsibility as coaches to help these players through this. It's, it's our responsibility to help them get through that. I had to do it in the semifinal game. I had to walk out on the mound after one of our pitchers gave up a couple hits. Was I could see he was getting a little nervous or upset or, and it was like walking over, getting on a knee, putting your arm around him. Hey buddy, you got this. Let's go. We're still up by four runs. Pound that strike zone. We got your back. And it was like a load was lifted off his shoulders. He went out, threw the next pitch, got a ground ball, got a fly ball, inning was over. So sometimes we have to go out there and, you know, and help them settle, you know, help settle themselves down. So, uh, yep, Pujols and the Cambrera. Yes, Coach, uh, Coach Merrill, that's exactly the who I was talking about. You know, Pujols went out there and and kind of handled the situation with, uh, you know, with the pitcher and just kind of showed him the ropes, right? Um, it can happen. It can happen to all of us. You know, what happened yesterday, I'm in my game. We, we, we had to go to the field. We had the report at 8 o'clock in the morning for our first game, right? So we were on the field at 8. We were practicing at 9. Game started at 10. We won that game. The next game wasn't until 3. So all the kids are at this park trying to find shade, play that game for two hours. Now we're in the finals. That didn't start till five o'clock. So these kids were outside on the field from eight o'clock until eight o'clock, you know? And it's just as hot for the coaches. You know, there's four of us and, you know, a kid boots a ball, we're playing so good, and then another guy boots a ball and then we throw the, it's almost like, it's hard for us as coaches to keep ourselves together and not, come on, let's go, you guys are better than this. You know, and it's like we're, we're all kind of managing ourselves after being outside in 95 degree weather. Like, we need to win this championship. We've been out here all day. Like, we're not losing. But then you just take a deep breath and you're like, you know, let's just keep on playing. <laughs> and, and, you know, um, so let's see. Let, let's get let's see here if we can uh, get our first question. Yeah, Coach, uh, Coach Schultz definitely will get that Cooperstown list. You're leaving on the 28th. We have we have two teams that also that are leaving on Friday. So two zone Red Hawk teams. I won't be down there, uh, but we'll have coaches going down there with the groups. We're we're, we're super pumped for that. Um, we've got an issue with a few kids being upset after strikeouts, slamming bats, helmets, trying to focus on quality at bats and managing meltdowns because uh, it snowballs to the other kids. That is that's like the topic of the week because we have the same exact thing with our team and trying to manage those guys like it's like you know what's going to happen right we have a leadoff guy and and he's such a spark plug he's such an energizer bunny he gets so fueled up and fired up all the time gets the team fired up but he also goes like this if something bad happens he sinks real quick but then he flies up real quick so it's managing those kind of personalities where some guys are just kind of float like this some guys are and it's like we just have to let him let him do his thing, right? If he gets out and he starts crying, he doesn't do it for long, and he snaps. Her. But the more you get on those guys, what are you crying for? Stop crying! Don't what? It just like makes it ten times worse. Opposed to letting him be, he's fine. Five minutes later, he's running out on the field and ready to make his next play. So we have something that we do with our team is we we try to talk to one another about how do you want it handle when something bad happens when you strike out how do you want us to handle you do you want us to pat you on the back do you want us to say hey get him next time do you want us just to leave you alone this is so important get your list out talk to every single kid coach to player write it down and share that with your coaches 
That way you understand your team, you understand the players, and you then all know how to handle it because we all have to handle things. We all want things to be handled differently, right? If two coaches are yelling kind of coaches, as soon as that kid cries, those two guys want to attack. He stop crying, cut it out. That doesn't work. That doesn't work for anybody. Now you got two coaches that are getting fired up. You have a kid that's crying that that's not helping him at all. And then he's then got to go out into the field and, and perform. So it's a great way to, to kind of understand your team, right? The other thing is, listen, if we take our helmet or our bat at any time, if we slam our helmet on the ground, you're automatically getting benched. No questions asked. I don't care what kid it is. I don't care whose kid it is. I don't care if it's my kid. If he strikes out and slams something, he's, he's on the bench. He knows it, he sits down, and the parents know it. That way, if it happens, if he wants to go sit on the bench, then he can slam whatever he wants. If he does it again, now he's sitting two innings. And then you make your rules as it goes. That way, there's no surprises. If the parents like, why is my kid sitting again? They know why. <laughs> or the kid will tell them why I sat for two innings because I slammed my bat or threw my bat or, you know. So, so I think that you as a coach have total control over what happens and how you want things done. Because some kids are just... You know, it, it, it happens so fast. They get so, they're so into the game. They practice so hard. They want to do well. And all of a sudden they don't. They just don't know how to handle themselves. So um, talk to the team about that. Make it crystal clear. Crystal clear that no matter who does it, this is what's going to happen. So I hope that helps. Um, I, have three of my, I have three of my 11 players that struggle uh, with attitude. Hardest part of coaching. 100%. Attitude is attitude is everything. And I always say the players most of the time will take on the personality of the coaches, right? If you're positive and you're trying to get them pumped up and you're motivating and you're talking and helping and the kids are going to do the same exact thing. If you're just yelling and screaming and pointing out things that are wrong, arguing with the umpire, yelling at every ball and strike, thinking it's a strike and not a ball, and the kids, you'll see the attitudes change immediately. That pitcher will start going like this on every close call, and it's just it just snowballs. So that's a really good just make sure you you audit and you monitor who's in your dugout with you because you might be the most rah, rah, positive guy. But if you have three coaches in your dugout that are not, and they're the ones that when you're out on the field are yelling and screaming and degrade, well, it's, you know, you need to have those conversations. Um, what do we got here? We have, uh, I coach 13U team. We feel about, I have a, uh, I coach up 13U team. How do you feel about kids playing up a year? I feel sometimes they might have the ability physically, but not mentally. Coach Meeks, that's a great point, especially when you're talking about 12 to 13. For us um, in New Jersey, when you're 13, you, you move up to the big field, right? You move up to the big field. There's new responsibilities. The game changes. There's double cuts. The distance is further. So just because you have a big kid that might be able to throw hard or hit the ball far, you don't need to move them up just because of that. Because um, a lot of times they're mentally not ready for the, for, for the next level. Um, sometimes we look at just physical kids and they're like, oh, look at this kid, he can easily play up. And then you actually talk to him and watch him in a game. What, what's his baseball IQ like? Is he, just because he's big doesn't mean he's, he's advanced and mature mentally with, you know, with those players and stuff like that. So. I don't think it's a rush to try to see how fast I can move my kid up and, and advance him up to the next level or two age levels up. It's just, because where do you go from there? The next year they're not gonna be able to play two years up and then now they feel like they're getting worse. Are they going down? How come I'm not you know, playing with the 15 year olds next year, then the 16 year olds the next year and you're only 14 years old? Well, you, you know, so depending on the situation, um, I would just just be careful with that. Um, I have a dilemma right now. We carry 11 players and we have tryouts next week. Currently, we have one kid not coming back. So my question is, how do you handle cutting a kid who has equal talent, but there are parents 
a handful of constantly on the coaches about playing time. The kid's a good kid. His parents are a handful. Well, I mean, when you're creating the team and you're creating the team motto and the mission statement, you need to make sure that the group and the team are, are part of that, right? If you constantly have a problem parent or a problem player, just put it all on the line. Have a sit down conversation. You know what? Maybe this organization just isn't for you. You know, this is what we're looking for. This is what we're trying to do. And maybe you have a different agenda, but you know, that's like some of the, some of the parents that are like win at all costs compared to a coach that's a developmental coach. The developmental coach doesn't care about wins and losses. Wins and losses are gonna happen by being a good coach and teaching them the right way. You're gonna end up winning a ton of games, we always say that, but a win at all coach, win at all cost coach will bat only nine, have the other three sit the bench the whole time, never play other kids. They'll pitch kids until there's 120 pitches and the kid's arm's ready to fall off. Like you see it all the time. So if you have a couple win at all cost parents, they're not gonna fit into a developmental program mission. They're just, they're gonna clash all the time. And then that win at all cost kid is gonna be is gonna be bouncing from team to team. We see it all the time. They go to this organization. Then they don't like that, they go to this organization. They don't like this, they don't like that. And it's like, if you were to ask the kid, he'd say, I wanna just play with these guys. I like it here. I like what they're doing. But some of the parents are, no way. You're an elite player. You gotta play here. No, we gotta, we're gonna go there instead. So you're the starting shortstop or we're gonna, and it just created, then three years later, the kid's not even playing baseball anymore because he can't live up to the expectations of what the parent wants, not just the kid playing. Um, so we ran into an issue this weekend where there was a rule change that nobody was aware of and was only being enforced on one field. Tournament director did a great job responding. The rule was batter gets six pitches, but can strike out swinging. Rule has changed. The swinging batter should be... Yeah, this was Coach McNeil. I think that... Uh, you know, sometimes rules are gonna change. I think it's up to the, the director to send out an email, to send out a text, to send everything out to the coaches, and then the coaches to clearly be able to address that to the team and the organization. And all that stuff happens in ground rules, right? This is an example. We we're playing on Sunday morning, and at this one field, there's a lot of uh, woods in the background. So there's this monster net that pretty much covers, there's the backstop and then the net, right? And he said, Everything off the net is live. It's not out of play. Not live in that if it hits the net, you can catch the ball and he's out, but it's just not out of play. So we had a ba we had a runner on second, base hit the center field. We round the guy, I'm scoring him. The center fielder takes the ball and fires it over the catcher's head and it hits the net. So one of our coaches was yelling, that's gotta be out of play. That's gotta be out of the play. He threw the ball like way over, but, and, but it hit the net. And then we talked to that coach and we're like, no, in the ground rules, he clearly stated that that stuff is, is all in play. So the reason why I say that's because the ground rules is so important. Any questions that you might have, ask during ground rules. Okay, is the first and third play legal or not? Is there a balk warning or does it go straight to calling it a balk? You know, what are the different rules that you might think of that you're not sure of and ask them all. You know, if we bat 10, can we run for the catcher? Can we run for the pitcher? Is it last batted out? Can we take a sub off the bench? You know, all those things, just ask them and make sure, and that way it'll make it so much easier. Uh, but that's, yeah, that's, you know, when, when something last minute like that happens and you're unaware of it, makes it really challenging. Um, I would definitely send an email in and just, you know, let that, let the organization know that it was a challenging thing for you and that, you know, uh, maybe they'll, you know, it'll help them next time making that same choice. Um, coach Brown, uh, for my kids and parents, uh, the tryout is for, I also have a coach watching the parents' manners, what they say or do. Yeah, Coach Brown, this is, that's awesome. You know, we do the same thing. We're running a tryout. It's not just the athletic ability of the kid makes or breaks the team. No, that's day one. Day one is all measurables. How hard do you throw? How hard do you hit? How fast do you run? You know, those sort of things. But then the, when we invite them back, the next day is game, infield, outfield, watching their body language. How do they play? Are they a good teammate? So if you only have a one-day tryout, 
try as much as possible to mix into the tryout process some of those things that's going to get you to be able to see if they're a good teammate. Maybe there's a relay race. Maybe there's a different a competition that you have in it. Something that you're going to see real quick of what these kids are like. Um, and also definitely have a parent meeting. Ask questions. Tell them about what your process is and the tournaments you're going to be in and what you're doing. And then have the parents ask questions. That way you can handle any of that stuff prior to picking your teams. I think that'll help a lot. Uh, Thomas McNeil, from a developmental standpoint, 8U coach perspective, are you pro strikeout or let them swing until that sixth pitch? Um, I think that 8U coach pitch, but are you pro strikeout or let them swing? I don't know. That's a good question. I think that for developmental purposes, you you let them keep on swinging and trying and playing. I don't know if it's a tournament that you're talking about or um, a game, you know, in the in a game situation. You know, we, we even do it ourselves when we're playing a, like an inner squad scrimmage. Um, you know, we start with a one-one count instead, so it forces the the player, the batter, you know, to to be more aggressive and to take his swings. And sometimes it'll be strike three, and we're like, hey, one more pitch. And then the kid will hit it, and we're just um, so I think that from a developmental standpoint, it's getting them to it's getting them to hit the ball, it's getting them to play. If it's a tournament, of course, and it's three strikes, then you know that is what it is. But I think the more you can get guys hitting, playing, having fun, understanding the rules, and playing the game, I think that's I think that's fine. Um, how do you manage pitchers' arms? Do you focus on innings or pitch counts? I'm seeing it differently almost at every tournament. So true. Um, what I do is when I go into the game again, I have 11s and I have 16s. Totally different. The older guys, the older guys can throw a little bit more. They're um, they're seasoned to throw a little bit more. They've they're they're through their high school season. We know kind of what their pitch count is, what they're comfortable with. And, and the younger guys as well, like what, trying to manage, you know, the volume in which they're throwing. So I don't go by how many innings. I go by how many pitches. So, you know, if a pitcher's throwing 12 pitches, 11 pitches, 13 pitches an inning, he could go almost all game, right? Because there's so, it's so low volume. There's no max effort. There's no long innings. Sometimes you have a pitcher, you know, he throws 22 pitches in the first inning. 37 pitches in the second inning. Yeah, that's only 60 pitches, but it's in such a short period of time that it becomes a stressful inning, right? You see him starting to losing velocity. You see him starting to throw more balls. He's starting to leave the ball high because his mechanics are breaking down. So I definitely go by pitches more than innings. Um, and there's a, you know, MLB Pitch Smart is a huge, uh, huge asset. You know, going on there, it just, it just gives uh, some parameters. It just gives some ideas. It gives, uh, you know, some, uh, just some, a different way to look at it. So MLB Pitch Smart, I think, is, you know, a really good tool for you um, on that. So that's how I, that's how I pretty much manage the arms. Um, what you got, Dom? Any more questions? Cool. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, I wanted to talk about as well, because this, I thought was super fun. And, uh, you know, we always bring music, we always bring music to the ball field and we put some songs on there, songs that the kids like, especially when you're outside all day, you're play, you're playing a ton of games, you know, we set the boom box up and it just has fun music and everyone's you know, kind of dancing and playing and having fun. And then the other teams kind of doing the same thing. And, you know, we got, we were in the first game on Sunday and I'm like, Hey, what do you guys think about the music? And the guy's like, man, this is awesome. We got to start doing this. And then the other team had theirs music going. It was just a really fun way of just kind of keeping the kids loose. Um, you know, getting them to, you know, when you're outside all day long, it's just, it loosens everything up instead of listening to crickets and nothing happening and it's like hot out. It, it takes it's your body moving. So if you have a little boom box or a little soundtrack at the kids to, to add some of their favorite songs to it, it really, it was super fun. We've done it the last three weekends. 
Um, and that's been super fun. Uh, what's your opinion on arm conditioning? Uh, throw a bit more, not high numbers. Yeah, well, you know, we, we have something that we're gonna, we're gonna add into the chat um, and it's an arm activation routine. It's, uh, it's eight exercises. Mikey Nickerak, our pitching expert, um, put it on there. It was a first round draft pick with the Rockies. And you know you can also find it on Jaeger bands. Like there's all different arm exercises that you can do, but we're really, uh, really big on making sure that the pitchers do their arm exercises first um, to get their arms loose, to get them activated, to then get them throwing. We, we feel like that's super important. Just like you run and do your hip exercises um, and your warm-ups prior to the game for everybody, we feel that the pitchers should be doing the same exact thing, um, you know, for their arm care. So we think those are some uh, really important things. Um, content, what do you? So one of my questions uh, for you watching this show would be, what are some things that you would like for us to be putting out there? What kind of content do you wanna see more of? On our exclusive Facebook page, we put out a little poll uh, hitting, fielding, pitching, game situations, strategies, and pitching was huge on the list at 44%. So we're going to be putting out more pitching videos. Uh, we just finished, um, this weekend we shot, we finished the videos, um, and we're finishing the promo video right now for our mental training program. And it's it's awesome because so many coaches are are asking us about, um, attitude and how do we help our kids with the bounce back factor? How do we help kids with, you know, uh, anxiety and, you know, kids that are depressed and they're trying to work through at bats, you know, we're working on that. We shot all the videos. It's going to be a great, great course. It's a way for you as a coach to help your players become better players, how to overcome things, how to bounce back after a strikeout. Um, and how to take the field with confidence. So we're super pumped about that. We're excited about that program. Again, the content, what do you wanna see from us? We're gonna keep on shooting these post, post weekend shows. We love these, you know, because you get to hear what, what we go through, right? What we're, what we're going through right now. And you know, a lot of it's the same. Another thing that we did this weekend that I think is super important is we have a, a list we have all the email addresses and the texts for all the parents. And we just talked about, hey, we're playing out here for 18, 18 innings today. So if we're gonna be out here for 18 innings, we know the first game, then we have a big break. And then we have back to back, three o'clock and three o'clock and five o'clock if we get into the championship. What are we gonna eat? What are we gonna drink? What are we gonna do? What are some games that we can play? So, you know, having watermelon and fruit and grapes and you know tons of water, uh, some Gatorades, and everybody is kind of getting together and we created like a little picnic out of it. And that way the kids aren't eating monster, you know, tons of stuff and you know, bad stuff. It's just light food, you know, in between games. So that's something that as a coach, I would highly recommend that you that you all do. Um, when you know a weekend's getting ready to come out, right? You're getting ready for a weekend, you gotta plan for the best and that is you're outside for nine hours. What are we gonna do? How are we gonna eat? You know, that sort of thing. Um, so I think that's uh, you know, an important topic. Uh, Coach Reyes, what kind of throwing motion would you implement most for the younger kids? Keeping in mind that utility players are goal 79, 10 years old, arm separation, small separation. That, that's a good one, uh, Coach Reyes, you know. Um, you know, everybody already has their own natural arm slot. So, you know, sometimes you have guys with longer arm circles. You have guys with, you have guys with shorter arm circles, like you're saying. Um, what would you teach? I'm just huge on just really getting into a more of a tighter, closer position when they're throwing. You know, it's almost like making sure that after they field the ball, their palms are down. I'm getting into this good position right here, and then I'm rotating into my throw. Not so much the big clock motion, but the much shorter field the ball, much smaller arm circle and throwing. So I think that teaching the basic um, throwing motion, I think is 
you know, where, where I would start. And that's what I do with all my guys, trying to teach them how to be quick, how to throw in the run, the different arm angles, the different arm slots. And whether you're eight years old or 18 years old, you can learn that stuff. I have seven year olds just throwing balls on the run like, you know, like Derek Jeter, you know, just cause you're, you're teaching them how to do it. You don't have to wait until they're 16 to teach them. You can teach them at six, seven, eight. It's just footwork, right? It's footwork or body positioning of how to do those things. It's just like teaching a backhand, just like teaching a forehand, short hops, long hops, in between hops. So it's just practice and routine, practice and routine. Um, hope that helps. Uh, how much we run in the same situations? Yeah, I know. Mental mindset, emotional mindset, little failure, nothing. Yep, yeah, those are all, those are all great things to have, uh, you know, in between meals. Um, another thing I'd like to, you know, touch on a little bit um, is the importance. I, tr I posted um, uh, on TikTok yesterday and also on Instagram, and it was our catcher. Our catcher, first inning of the game, throws down to second base, and immediately he turns around and he shakes the umpire's hand and says, hi, I'm Joey. And then the umpire says, hi, I'm Mike or whatever, you know, that sort of thing. And it just creates a, um, a relationship, just the communication between the catcher and the umpire, right? The catcher's gonna be there for the next 120 pitches. You know, so you getting his name, him getting your name, it's just a, a way, I think a good way of just showing respect to the umpire and starting the game. Once the game's over, you're handshaking or fist pumping the other team, and then all the guys go over to the umpire and they shake their hand and say, good game, Blue. Because at the end of the day, no matter what happens prior to the game, you're having communication and respect, and at the end of the game, communication and respect. Because we were in one of our games yesterday, um, and these, after the game was over, the other team lost, and three of their players just walked right down the list walked right down the line and never even shook hands. They didn't give high fives, they didn't shake hands, and it was just so brutal. And the first thing that I said to my, my guys when we took our knee and went to left field was like, we will never, ever do that. I don't ever wanna see anybody, no matter how mad you are that we lost, we always handshake or fist pump every single guy in the other team and we say, good game. Good game, good game, no matter how mad we are. Because it was just so, I just couldn't believe that three of the guys were 11 years old and just ran down with their hands down and just blew right through the line and it was like, whatever. So that's just what happens, right? So I feel like no matter what happens in hard games, it's our job as coaches um, and our responsibility to, that's a, that's a lesson learned, right? That's, that was a perfect situation for me to teach our guys a lesson. This is, these are things that we're not going to do. And these are the things that we are going to do. Um, so our stickers have a, ha a sticker on the back of their helmet. Our catchers that say, I love umpires. It's always a good conversation starter. I love that. I, I posted that on one of our Facebook pages. It said, it had it right on the chest guard of the, uh, uh, of, of the catcher. And it says, I love umpires. And I thought that was the coolest thing. I'm like, that, that's one good way of, uh, maybe getting an extra call, but that's cool putting it on their helmet as well. Like, that's awesome. Um, I also shot a video on TikTok with this guy's name was Jake and um, games, games halfway through, we were just talking. I'm like, Hey, I, you know, when did you start umpiring? He's like, this year's my first year. I'm like, Oh, what do you think? He's like, this is my last year. I'm like, I'm like, come on. You, what do you mean? It's your last year. He's like, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm, uh, I play college baseball. I know the game. This is, it's fun. He's like, but the parents, he goes, I, I can't even, uh, I'm not doing it. And his buddy was there too. The, he went to a different school. I think one went to Lafayette. Um, I forget where the other one went, but they were both pitchers. And they were saying that, you know, they got their uh, certification together, at, you know, at the same time. And they're just kind of doing it through the summer and they're buddies. And they did a great job too, like awesome job. Um, and it's just it just thinks to hear them say that they won't do it anymore because the parents, he's like, it's just so, every, you know, every call I make, I'm wrong. I either made the right call, if I call it a strike, this guy's mad at me. If I call it a ball, that guy's mad at me. He's like, and I kind of can overlook it, but when you're doing it for 
<laughs> he, he coached like he umpired three games that day, right? So that's a lot of that's a lot of times be, feeling like you're wrong throughout the day of just getting you know beat up and talked to. But hey, catch umpires have a tough job, and I think it's our job just to make it fun and you know, like I always tell our guys, that umpire could care less who wins the game, right? He's calling the way he sees it. He doesn't care if we win or the other team wins. He's just calling balls and strikes. He's calling out or safe, and he's doing the best he can. So, you know, we, we have to respect that. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, you know, it's, it, it, it's fun to turn the page right now. I'm going to turn the page and go to 16U baseball because on Friday we're going to uh, Lehigh University and we're doing a showcase camp. So we take batting practice on Saturday in front of 10 college coaches. So our guys are going to take batting practice. Um, then they're going to play a game. And then on Sunday, they're going to take infield outfield and then in front of 10 college coaches and then play another game. So what I'm trying to do is I, you know, I reached out to all the coaches to see you know, who the college that are going, got their names, got their schools. And now I send that to my guys to then send an email to those coaches saying, hey, coach so-and-so, I'm excited to come to Lehigh this weekend. I heard you're going to be there. I'm interested in your school. And that way, it's just a little welcome letter to be like, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. So Duke Baxter hits a double. It's like, yeah, that guy, I, I know that name from somewhere. You know, meanwhile, I'm the one that sent them a, a, an email on Friday saying, hey, coach, I'm interested in your school. You know, it does make a difference. Um, so I also got pretty much, you know, what the itinerary is. We're going to be hitting off the, the hack attack at say 45 feet and it's going to be set for 75 miles an hour. Well, throughout the week this week, I have allocated times for my players to come in, hit off the hack attack. So they're prepared and ready because a lot of them haven't, maybe haven't hit off a machine before, or they're not good at hitting off the machine. Them knowing that's what the situation is going to be on Saturday is a great mental preparation for them. Like, yeah, I've been hitting all week off it. I'm really ready for Saturday, you know? So for any of you older co guys that are coaching older players, you know, having them be prepared, you know, cause they're gonna be nervous. There's 10 colleges there. For some of them, it's their first showcase ever. Um, talking them through, what's it gonna be like? How are we gonna do it? How are we gonna handle it? Um, you know, body language is so important. You never know who's watching. Well. This is the first showcase where all those things really come into play. So we're super excited about that. It's, you know, it's going to be fun. Um, question from Coach Robert. What is the best conversation to tell eight-year-olds on how to not fear kid pitch? Now we're changing gears from 16U back to 8U. Here's, here's my best advice, right? Because um, I have a son who is in that same boat of he got hit in the face when he was younger and it's like he's just so nervous. He had to wear the whole face guard he wanted because he was nervous and we were trying to do everything that we could to kind of help him get over the fear of that. Um, but the more you can put the kids in that situation, the more comfortable they're going to be. So when a pitcher's throwing maybe a, a bullpen or he's warming up or he's throwing at practice, having kids wear their helmets and stand in there and see more live, you know, live pitches come at them, teaching them how to get out of the way of the ball properly and safely is a huge thing. Because that way, if you're working on tossing some balls, teaching them how to tuck and turn, drop the bat, turn towards the catcher, um, and mixing that in, now they're gonna be co more comfortable. Like, oh, when a ball's coming at me, I'm used to getting out of the way. I know how to get out of the way. And I know, I know how to do it safely. The other day, people are gonna think I'm crazy. I had my 16 year olds hitting, and I'm like, all right guys, the first three balls I'm throwing at you. And I was close, but we were working on tucking and turning. And I threw three balls that hit them right in the butt. They turned and tucked, boom. And they, they were cracking up laughing at it, but it's like, one of those things where you have to work on how to get out of the way properly, because if you have kids that are doing this, right, they're gonna get hit right in the face, right in the neck, right in the stomach. You know, this is not how you get out of the way of the ball. This is how you get out of the way of the ball. You know, um, so making sure that they tuck and turn and they drop their, their, their bat is just super big. So that's one of the things on, on talking to that kid about, you know, that's afraid of the ball. Um, Teach them how to get out of the way and put them in that situation as much as possible will definitely help them. 
Uh, my son's gonna try out for a travel baseball this year. What kind of drills should he expect to see in the tryout? I would say expect fly balls, right? Fly balls, ground balls. They may ask him to pitch. So he's gonna go onto the mound and maybe throw 10 balls um, off the mound to the, to the catcher. If he's a catcher, have him get ready to catch. They may have him block and they're probably gonna have him throw down to second base. If he's an outfielder, make sure he can track balls, make sure he can catch them, make sure he can shuffle and make good throws um, into the cutoff. So really everything you can think of in a baseball game is what you're gonna probably see in tryouts. So running home to first as fast as you can, or they may have you run home to home, right? That might be a running station. Then they'll put you at shortstop and just hit ground balls. And you have to catch them and throw them to first. Then they'll put you in the outfield, hit you fly balls, you have to catch it and throw it to the cutoff guy. So it's gonna be really basic, but the best advice that I can give is have fun and give it 100%. Don't worry about making a perfect throw and throw it easy. They wanna see how you throw. So take that ball shuffle and gun that thing full throttle. Because so many times we'll be in tryouts, trying out pitchers, they're throwing 67 miles an hour, 67 miles an hour. And you have the radar gun, you're like, okay. And like, is that as hard as you can throw? They're like, no. I'm like, okay, we'll throw this one hard. And it's like 73 miles an hour. And you're like, what the? Why would you throw 67 in a tryout? Just when you can throw 76 miles an hour in a tryout. Like, take that ball and fire that baby. Um, when you feel the ground ball, throw it hard to first. When you're feeling, like, like, do everything all out. Go full speed, run as fast as you can. Swing hard, drive that baseball, throw it hard. All those things, hustle on the field, hustle off the field. Um, all those things are so important. Um, so, I think that's it. I think that's uh, that's everything that I have. Uh, you know, it, it can go on and on. Um, you know, I wanted to make sure we talked a lot about the mental game because I saw a lot about that this weekend. Um, and uh, you know, that a lot of that stuff is important. Also, if you like our drills, you can go on our Instagram, on our Facebook, on our TikTok. We have tons of drills, tons of motivational talks. Um, you can get it all. If you click the link below, it's a three-day free trial. There's over 900 videos, all of our lineup cards, our practice plans, our codes of conduct, our arm activation, like everything you can get your hands on that Dominate the Diamond has, you can get it free for three days. So click on that link, get all that information. I hope you like it, we hope you enjoy it. Coach Steve and I work really hard and the whole entire Dominate the Diamond team on just trying to bring everything that we have together to help you as coaches be the best coach that you can be. So hope that helps. Thanks so much for watching today. We'll see you next week. Enjoy the week. Practice hard. The things that you didn't do well this weekend, practice during the week. For those of you going to Cooperstown, have a blast. Have fun. Continue to make memories because these kids are going to remember the, that week for the rest of their life. I have, my kids are still talking about it. I have guys that are 20 years old that go, remember when we went to Cooperstown, how fun it was? We were playing wiffle ball home run derby in the, in, in the bunk. We were doing, remember when it was raining out and we were sliding down the mountain? All those things. So just have fun with the coaches. We'll see you next time. Duke Baxter at Zone Sports County with Dominate the Diamond. Go dominate the day. Thank you.